refreshments as Fresh. Professor Blackman goes. Um, my name is Adam White. I'm an assistant professor here. I teach administrative law and also I direct the law school's Center for the Study of the Administrative State. Um, thank you for joining us. And the most important announcement I'm going to make at the beginning is in our offices we have about 5,000 coffee mugs. And so if you need one or two or seven coffee mugs, please take them from the table outside the door. Um, as I said, by the way, this is meant to be a casual event, so please feel free to refresh your refreshments either here or outside as Professor Blackman goes. Um, but now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Blackman. Thank you. Uh, Joshua Blackman is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law in Houston, where he specializes in constitutional law. He co-edits a casebook that I know is used in at least some classes here, uh, Constitutional Law Cases in Context. He's also, there it is, come on doorstop, Josh. Um, it's heavy. It splits in half, makes nice kindling. There's also, uh, he's also written some of the most authoritative and significant books on the history of the Affordable Care Act and the litigation surrounding it. The first book was called uh, uh, Unprecedented, about the first uh, uh, Affordable Care Act litigation. The second one, the follow-up was called Unraveled. The third one, I think, is going to be called Indestructible or? Undone. Undone. That's, that's a way well for that one. Um, <laughs> But I want to say, he's also the author of scores of articles, book chapters, essays, blog posts. He's, I've been reading his blog since right after he graduated from this law school 10 years ago. He also founded Fantasy SCOTUS, I would like bet on Supreme Court decisions. Something like that. Um, he founded the Harlan Institute. Um, he clerked for Judge Danny Boggs on the Sixth Circuit. And most important of all, of course, he is a proud uh, alum of this law school. He graduated from this law school 10 years ago this year, I guess. 10 years ago this May. Amazing. So happy homecoming. Thank, Thank you for you. giving us Thank the you. excuse to drink during daylight hours. Thank you. Thank um, you. Just the background on this so you know, the program, the, the Center for the Study of the Administrative State, we do a series of conferences throughout the year, private workshops and public conferences on different themes. And one of the ones we did earlier this year was titled uh, New Normals, question mark, uh, the courts, no, the Trump administration, the courts, and the rule of law on just interesting issues that were sort of arising for the first time in the context of litigation around the Trump administration. So we had a, a, some really interesting papers. We had a full public conference in December. Professor Blackman was unavailable because his first daughter was born like right or, like a day or two around the conference. Seemed like a bad time to travel. Bad idea. I tried to force him to, but he wouldn't do it. Nope. Um, but we're very glad he could join us today for a casual conversation. He'll talk for about 25 minutes, um, then you all can ask questions. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Thank you. Friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at Mason, and in particular this room. This room is where I had my first law school class ever. It's surreal. I had Josh Wright for contracts back in the fall of 2006, which makes me feel very old. So it's good to be here. Also. Um, Adam and Leah and everyone else in the center, you're doing a wonderful job uh, putting together a wonderful programming. You're very fortunate, Mason, to have this. The topic today is investigating the president. And in particular, the question is, can the president be issued a subpoena? Now, without question, the president is not above the law. Right. The far more important question is what law applies to the president. Um, actions that are within the law for the president are above the law for everybody else. The Constitution gives the president certain powers that no one else has. Uh, only the president can issue pardons, supervise the executive branch, nominate and remove officers, negotiate treaties, and host of other things. And the courts have consistently read the president in some of a unique fashion. Uh, my talk today focuses on one aspect of that. Can the courts issue a subpoena to the president to either testify or to produce documents. The story begins a long time ago, uh, two centuries ago, in fact. Aaron Burr, the former vice president, sought to compel President Jefferson to appear at trial and to produce certain documents. And who presided at that trial is actually John Marshall, who was a circuit justice for the court of Virginia. And he directed a subpoena to President Jefferson to show up in court. Jefferson did not show up in court, and he gave a redacted version of the document that was requested. And then Marshall took no action, told the president contempt. Fast forward 
to the 1970s. You have the USB Nixon. President Nixon said that he had an absolute right and absolute immunity to quash a subpoena. The court rejected that argument. But that case arose in a fairly unique context in which defendants in the Watergate prosecutions wanted these documents, these White House recordings for their defense, what's called the right of compulsory process. So where are we now? I wrote this paper for Adam's lovely conference in anticipation that special counsel Mueller would try to subpoena the president and drag him into court, which thankfully didn't happen. We can just move past that. Uh, but we still may yet get a subpoena from the House and other entities that might try to subpoena the president, although maybe the attorney general. But I want to focus on the history here, right? What does the prosecution of Aaron Burr teach us about the limits of presidential subpoenas? Now, this may sound like a fairly obscure question, in case with Aaron Burr, but the actions of the founding era, right? 10 years after independence, 20 years after independence, 30 years, these have a lot of weight today. So let's start with Aaron Burr. You probably know most from the Alexander Hamilton musical. Uh, yes, he shot Hamilton. And then he got in some trouble. Um, after he killed Hamilton, he became vice president. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> dueling, right? And that didn't go so well for him. And at some point, he decided to travel west. And he got involved in some foreign intrigues. Exactly what he was doing is not clear to this day. But President Jefferson was convinced that he was engaging in treason, in acts of treason. And President Jefferson basically directed his Department of Justice to indict Aaron Burr for treason. Uh, the case was actually tried in the Circuit Court of Virginia in Richmond. And between March and October of 1807, two trials were held. The first was a felony trial, which he was ultimately not convicted. And the second was a misdemeanor trial, which was also not convicted. Um, during this period, John Marshall issued 17 written opinions by himself. And he had several shorter decisions from the bench. He wrote over 200 pages of reported case law in the reporter. Uh, Marshall, whether you hate him or love him, was a monster. Right? He would put Dick Posner to shame even by modern day standards. He wrote so much in such a compressed time with no computer, no internet, nothing, all by himself. It's remarkable. Uh, now, Marshall's rulings on the merits were very narrow. Uh, he read the crime of treason in a very narrow fashion, which resulted in Burr being acquitted. And that's not my focus today. You can, you can say that maybe in criminal law, perhaps, whether you got it right. Uh, my focus is on how Marshall treated the president with respect to the process question. Um, in both trials, Aaron Burr asked the court to issue what's called a subpoena ducis tecum, right? What's a subpoena ducis tecum? That requires the witness to come to court and produce certain documents. Okay, what document was that issue? Aaron Burr wanted a document from one General Wilkinson, okay? This was a letter in which Wilkinson basically accused Burr of being a traitor. Now, the irony is that Wilkinson was actually an agent of the Spanish government, right? So the guy accusing Burr of, of breaking the law was himself under control of a foreign power. So this entire case is crazy. Burr knew this, and he wanted the letter from Wilkinson to try and get Wilkinson in trouble, OK? And the defendant demanded that Jefferson produce the original copy of Wilkinson's letter. However, the United States attorney in Virginia offered only a redacted copy of the letter, right? Jefferson wanted to uh, omit certain portions, which he deemed national security, you might want to call it. The term didn't exist back then, but it was confidential, OK? And this conflict didn't happen in one instance. It stretched over the entirety of the, of the summer of 1807. And what I brought to this paper was they looked not only at the trial record, but also the correspondences between Hay, the US attorney, and Jefferson. At the time, Jefferson was at Monticello, his vacation home, and they were writing back and forth. And Jefferson took a keen interest in the matter. Indeed, Jefferson gave direct instructions. No, they were orders. He ordered the US attorney to take certain positions in court. 
He told them what to do and what not to do. I'll go through some of these examples, which are insane. That's some of the things that Jefferson said. Marbury versus Madison does come up in a minute. Just wait. Um, in the felony trial, Marshall ordered that Jefferson should be required to uh, submit the entire letter, the original copy, without redactions. Jefferson did not comply. And in the misdemeanor trial, Jefferson provided a redacted version. Now, I'll jump to the end. I'll give you the conclusion. What do we draw? What lessons can we draw from these proceedings? It's tough. Um, both Jefferson and Marshall engaged in a lot of bluster. But in the end, they sort of met in the middle, and they were both happy with it. So I don't know what that means. But let's, let's just start with the Burr proceeding. There's some good stuff in here, which I went through the entire record. Um, so in May of 1807, uh, a grand jury was convened to try Burr on high treason charges. Jefferson wrote a letter to the US attorney. <laughs> and he urged the US attorney to discuss Marbury versus Madison. Now, you probably know this from con law, right? Marbury was a case where, where uh, Thomas Jefferson refused to seat the midnight judge. <laughs> Jefferson urged the US attorney to say, denounce Marbury for it is not law. And he's basically wanting his lawyer to argue that Marbury was wrongly decided. It had nothing to do with the case, but he was just pissed at Marshall. <laughs> The lawyer wrote back, I cannot conceive why this would be worth notice in the Burr case. <laughs> However, if it should be, I shall avail myself of the remarks which you have so good to communicate. So <laughs> this was just saying the frame. Okay. On June 9th, uh, Burr asked the court for a subpoena to be directed to the president to require him to produce this letter. And Burr said it was material for the defense. Um, the U.S. attorney objected, saying, I'm not prepared to give the letter. Okay, that day, the U.S. attorney wrote Jefferson and said, Mr. Burr moved the court for a subpoena direct to the president. Okay, they want the original letter. Then a debate arose about whether you could actually request this document before the indictment issued. Um, Burr said the letter was material to his defense. In other words, if this letter was produced, he might not get indicted at all, right? In fact, the evidence was exculpatory. The guy can't get indicted. And indeed, the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution gives the accused the right to compulsory process. What does that mean? The court will help you gain documents that may be useful in your defense. It turns out that the letter, I think, would have been useful in Burr's defense. Uh, so Burr argued that the Sixth Amendment does play an important role here. But then he asked the question, can a subpoena be directed at the president at all? And Burr basically said, there's no problem. I'm sorry, how, uh, Marshall said there's really no problem. If there's a right to this document, nothing in the Constitution prevents a court from requiring the president to show up in court and produce the document. There is no exception, Marshall wrote. He said maybe there might be a, a situation where the president needs to be in the nation's capital. Right, and can't come down to produce the evidence. But that is the exception, not the rule. And he says, the court has no choice but to issue the subpoena. The law does not discriminate between the president being summoned to give his attendance and the president merely giving these papers. So the marshal dismissed any claim what might be called absolute privilege. Okay, So then it gets a little funny. The clerk issues a subpoena to the president. And by the way, the clerk was actually John Marshall's brother, William Marshall, as a sm small family, right? Um, and the clerk said, I demand that you, the president, appear in Richmond to testify in the Burr trial, bring the document. Okay? He commanded the president to appear. That was significant. Right, for a court to demand the attendance of the president before there was even an indictment presented. Burr didn't even go that far. Burr said, look, I don't need Jefferson here. I don't want him here. Just bring the document. Right? But Marshall said the president has to come here. Jefferson replied. He was livid. Okay? Jefferson wrote. Okay. Uh, he wrote. I will voluntarily provide the documents, but that's it. He said, I will not comply with 
this order. If they want to depose me in the Capitol, I'll do that, but I will not go to Richmond. But then he wrote a separate letter, and this is actually crazy. He said, uh, he was not surprised that Burr and his counsel would wish to convert this trial into a contest between the judiciary and executive authorities. Okay? He said, he did not believe that Marshall's prudence or good sense would permit him to press the subpoena. And then he gave his U.S. attorney a warning. He, he wrote, let me read this part. He said, if the Chief Justice, contrary to expectation, proceeds to issue any process against the executive department, I want instant notice. Right? In such a case, the U.S. attorney should advise U.S. Marshal on the Chief Justice's conduct as he will be critically placed between us. He wrote, the safest way for the Marshal will be to take no part in the, in the exercise of any act of force order in this case. He's basically telling the court officers, ignore the Marshal ruling. He's saying, if it gets to a conflict, you tell the Marshal of the court, stand down. I am the president, which is remarkable. And Jefferson says, but I hope the discretion of the Chief Justice will suffer. This question will basically go away. And then he said, maybe at the next session of Congress, Congress should consider legislation to give the president immunity. That Congress should try to override what, what Marshall's trying to do. But he says, my hope is that Marshall will not divide his court and said, well, for truce. Um, it's stunning language that Jefferson explains. And then he goes through this very lengthy discussion about how each of the branches must be separate. And if the executive, I'm sorry, the judicial, could directly order the president to take action, it would subvert the separation of powers. For example, what happens if the, uh, a sheriff in Virginia call John Marshall to join a posse. Is that it? Please, right? They call to join a posse, right? And Marshall says, well, I can't leave. I have court to tend to. It's not someone else's role to decide how to manage their own branch. Jefferson said, the leading principle of our Constitution is the independence of the legislative, executive, and judiciary of each other. And none are more jealous of this than the judiciary. He took no action to comply with the subpoena. Uh, Burr's trial proceeded. And eventually Burr said, um, where's my document, right? Where's my letter? We got this long trial going on. And the US attorney's like, well, let me check, uh, let me check my papers. Just trying to stall and buy time. And they come back to it a few days later. He's like, well, uh, I don't have it. OK? Uh, Burr moved again to subpoena the president. And Marshall took no action. Didn't do anything else. Um, Marshall backed off. For one reason or the other, he wasn't willing to push the issue. He gave the president a subpoena that you must attend this hearing in Richmond. Jefferson never showed up, didn't send a letter. He sort of backed off. Uh, what lesson do we draw from this? There was no contempt citation. There was no punishment. I think Jefferson won round one, at least. OK, so fast forward a few months. Burr was acquitted based on Marshall's instructions, very narrow instructions. And immediately, Jefferson said, indict him again on a misdemeanor. Right? So they couldn't get Burr on a felony charge. They tried to get him on a misdemeanor charge, where I think it would be easier to prove. Um, once again, Burr's like, hey, where's that letter? Right? Didn't I request this letter, Marshall? And so again, basically, Burr once again renewed his request for the letter. And the US attorney said, well, I'll give you a copy with parts cut out. And Burr's like, no, no, I want the original letter. OK, so once again, the Chief Justice said, OK, let's try this again. Um, I'm going to issue, issue the subpoena, but I'll review the document in camera that is inside the court. right? So I will review to see if there's anything inappropriate. Okay. <laughs> if you can imagine, this, this, didn't, this, this wasn't going to work. Um, so the situation was basically nearly the same as before. And if the president makes objections, I'll decide whether something should be withheld. OK. So Hay, again, writes to Jefferson. Jefferson is pissed. And he says, no, no, we're not going to do this. I am going to give you a copy of the letter. And I'm going to cut parts out. And I'm not going to let Marshall decide what to exclude. I'm going to decide what we're going to exclude. And he sent 
a letter to the U.S. Attorney. I want to read this sentence. He said, I do not believe that the district courts have a power of commanding the executive government to abandon superior duties and attend, attend at them at whatever distance. I am unwilling by any notice of the subpoena to set a precedent which might sanction a precedent so preposterous. And by the way, this letter, he says, by the way, James Madison was here with Monticello. He agrees with me. Right? He's like, <laughs> Madison's with me. Uh, uh, Madison said it was OK. He was visiting Monticello that week, as it were. OK? Um, he, he noted that if the prosecution were defeated, it will heap coals of fire in the head of the judge. That is John Marshall. So this is very, very heated language. It's remarkable. I wish presidents wrote like the same. Imagine like it's like Trump, like like hashtag sad. You know, we got we got we, we got we got good stuff here. And then eventually Jefferson gave a copy of the redacted letter, which was submitted to the court. And as far as I can tell, um, Jefferson took no action, whatever, on the letter. He just took no action on it at all. He just let it go. And Burr was acquitted. Now, the fact that Burr was acquitted, it didn't really matter what happened to the letter because he didn't actually need it. But what lessons can we draw from this case? Um, I think it's difficult to summarize precisely what precedents were set. Um, through their words, both Jefferson and Marshall expressed a broad conception of their respective power. Jefferson asserted a right, an absolute right, to withhold documents and agreed to provide evidence to the courts only voluntarily. Again, he did it voluntarily, not an order. Moreover, he rejected the power of the court to command the president's attendance in court. Instead, he said he was sit for a deposition in the Capitol, Washington. In contrast, Marshall asserted a power to compel the president's attendance in court and to demand the production of documents. Only complete documents be submitted, and the court, not the president, would decide what portions are shared with the defendant. Right, so on paper, at least, they had really bold positions. Yet, in practice, a little bit different. Uh, through their actions, both Jefferson and Marshall acted in a far more conciliatory fashion. I mean, they hated each other, but they sort of got along in public, I guess. Jefferson, in fact, gave a redacted version of the letter for Burr's defense. Marshall, after issuing his board ruling, didn't hold the president in contempt, which he perhaps could have. He simply proceeded with the trial and let the, office, uh, let the issue linger. Uh, the Office of Legal Counsel wrote an opinion in 1973, which I, I agree with. And he said, I'll read the quote, it would seem that the president asserted full power to decide what could and cannot be disclosed safely, uh, but in fact gave the court most of the requested material. Marshall inconsistently asserted full power in the premises, but immediately qualified the assertion with an indecisive comment that the court would ever proceed against the president as an ordinary individual. Um, it's very hard to draw lessons from this concrete example. I'm reminded of one of my favorite opinions of all time, Justice Jackson in Youngstown. And he wrote, a judge like an executive advisor may be surprised at the poverty of really useful and unambiguous authority applicable to concrete problems of executive power as they present themselves. He added, just what our forefathers did envision or would have envisioned had they foreseen modern conditions must be divined from materials almost as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. Alas, not even our forefathers, Marshall, Madison, Jefferson, could agree on the limits of presidential subpoenas. So where does that leave us today, right? I don't know what would have happened if Bob Mueller try to subpoena the president. I think the fact that he was not quite independent, he was a special prosecutor, special counsel, might make it a little more complicated. But I don't think the Burr precedent gives the authority needed to issue such a presidential subpoena. Why? These subpoenas arose during a criminal prosecution. We have arrived at compulsory process. Same for the Nixon precedents, right? The Nixon tapes were requested not during the investigation, but during the prosecution of the co-conspirators in the Watergate uh, crime. Right? You have a right of process. Um, the Nixon case was very much limited to criminal justice. But what about Mueller? Right? What if they merely want to subpoena the president as part of an investigation? Not after an indictment, not after an arraignment, merely as an investigation. I don't think Burr or Nixon go quite that far. What if the other question, Congress? Right? 
What happens when Congress tries to issue a subpoena to the president? Now, that's not going to happen, I don't think, because Bob Barr, right, is the attorney general who has possession of the Mueller report. So I think this matters. But I don't think we have much evidence at all that the Congress can subpoena the president. Okay. And let's say I'm right about this, right? Let's say that there are limits on whether the president can be subpoenaed. What about the president being indicted, right? And I want to answer this in a very important way. What if Jefferson didn't comply and said, Marshall, screw you, I'm not going to do it? Could Marshall have held the president in contempt of court? Could he have held the president in custody because he would not comply to produce this document? And if the answer is no, that the president can't be held in contempt of court, that makes it very difficult to put the president in the normal criminal proceeding mantra, right? Um, we know from Clinton against Jones that a civil lawsuit can proceed against a sitting president. If that's right or wrong, I'm not sure, right? But left open the criminal question. Um, but what happens during a criminal trial when the president has to be present, right? You gotta be, you gotta be there for a criminal trial at least some phases. And you know, the president says, Your Honor, I need a recess. You know, ICBM's coming and gotta go, right? <laughs> or, Mr. Your Honor, I need a recess. Uh, we have a war going on. Recess is for six months. I gotta do more important things, right? If I am not present, the entire executive branch stops, right? I'm not 25th amending, I'm not stepping down, you can't do this. And what if a judge says, no, I'm holding contempt, uh, Marshall, take him away. This was my final exam question a couple years ago, even before Trump. Uh, what would happen if a judge, a state judge, actually ordered the president remanded into custody? Uh, would the Secret Service stand down? Uh, I think it would not go well. And if, if I'm right about that, that the normal criminal end game can't work to the president, I think it casts serious doubt whether the preliminary, the procedural issues like subpoenas can be issued against the president. Um, all of this to say is we have presidential elections every four years. And this is my belief after the Mueller stuff. We have Congress every two years and a president every four years. In the event we have a really bad president, Congress has tools at their disposal and we're never more than two years away from a midterm election. But injecting the courts into these matters, I think, is a disaster. It's a mistake. We took two years from the Mueller report. And had they tried to subpoena the president, it would have run out the entire term of taking years even more until the court gets involved. So I think the political process is god awful, but it's a lot better than the courts. And the courts should, I think, avoid the president whenever and however they can. All right, thank you so much. And I welcome your questions. Yes, in the back. You started out by saying uh, the president is not above the law. Everybody seems to agree that the state the rules. Is there anything, any language in the Constitution at all that supports the position that the president cannot be in the cannot be subpoenaed? You said, you said, it cannot be what? The Constitution, any language you can cite to that says the president cannot be subpoenaed or cannot be subpoenaed. Okay, so good question. So if you couldn't hear, the question was, is there any language in the Constitution uh, which suggests the president can't be indicted or subpoenaed? So I'll start with Article 2, Section 1, right? Um, the executive powers vest in the president. And if we take a view that the president's in charge of the Justice Department, uh, that means he gets to direct the prosecutions. Um, that at least suggests that the president's not going to indict himself. Uh, we had a special situation during the Kent Starr years because Congress created this independent council which sort of exists outside the executive branch. And I'm with Scalia on that one. I think Scalia was right and Morrison v. Olson. Uh, but if we start from the premise that we have an executive branch, um, then this, I don't think it's even feasible for the feds to indict the president. Um, with respect to state indictment, which I think is a much, much more likely scenario, Right, can the New York Attorney General or the Manhattan DA indict the president? I think supremacy clause plays into it. I think the, uh, an indictment to try to take down the president would perhaps be a violation of the Supreme Law of the land. Uh, is there a specific textual argument? Uh, others not. Uh, uh, fortunately, as Justice Jacks reminds us, there are seldom textual arguments for many of these things. Thank you for the question. Yes, in the back. Considering that uh, the president can't participate in criminal proceedings effectively, or criminal charges are being brought against someone. Assuming impeachment is off the table for political considerations, what is the recourse if the president just shoots somebody? Well, um, <laughs> you know, if you shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, right? <laughs> um, 
I, maybe I'm naive, Adam, maybe I'm too naive. I think if the president actually killed someone, I think there would be a bipartisan consensus he has to remove from office. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, right? Um, I think you would probably have to resign. Um, I think the tougher question is, can you indict the president now to toll the statute of limitations and then charge him after his term runs out? Right? I think that's what some, some, some jurisdictions might try to do. Um, I think indicting the president would have a serious impact on his ability to engage in foreign affairs. Uh, I think there's some problems there. Uh, but I, I, th I think if the president actually murdered someone while he was in office, I, I'm pretty sure we'd have an indictment or a re resignation. Yes? I want to follow up on that question because you started the talk by saying it's not a, you know, you can kind of paraphrase, it's not a crime when the president does it or, you know, he has powers that other people yeah. don't have. But your answer to the last question strikes more of, no, the president can't do that, but it's really an immunity. Now, maybe it's an academic question, but a lot of the way you're presenting this is presenting it in a way that seems like it's an incident of sovereign immunity or it's maybe some kind of residual immunity that the crown would have had that's now best in the president and not the, you know, I guess you run the risk of having some, but it seems to be more a question of immunity from process than it does a question yeah. of lawfulness or unlawfulness, especially when you get to examples like a, you know, a crime that is not politically related. Or yeah. And so you yeah. Know, it's one thing on the obstruction side to say, no, the president can't obstruct justice by exercising his office and firing him. But it seems to be quite different when you say, look, we, I acknowledge he can't murder somebody, but he's not subject to process. That seems to really, to me, to fall on the immunity side. Of the wall. I, I think, yeah, I, th I think your framing is well put. This, this is a question of process, right? We have certain procedures by which people are tried of crimes, convicted of crimes, have to go through different processes, their appeals. And that sort of process um, is very difficult to square with the president's daily duties to lead the executive branch. Now, I think the better argument, and again, I don't think it's possible, but if you could simply indict the president now and try him later, or what I think would be ideal is you make a deal with the president, uh, you, you waive the statute of limitations, and we just indict you later. You, you strike some sort of deferred prosecution agreement, which I think might be feasible, rather than forcing an indictment now. Uh, but I, just to think about it, if the president actually did commit such an obvious crime, and I'm not talking about like obstruction or something silly, like an actual murder, I, I don't mean silly, but you know, firing a principal officer is not obstruction. I don't care what your state of mind is. It doesn't matter. Um, but if, if there was some really egregious crime, I think the president would have to, as a matter of real politics, either resign or agree to a deferred prosecution. But, I, but it's, not, it's not the king can do no wrong, right? I think he'd be prosecuted later once he have office. Uh, but I think they'd have to toll the statute. In fact, I'll, I'll quote Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh wrote an article on this where he said Congress should pass a law that automatically tolls any statute of limitation against the president while he's in office. I think that's a good idea. I think it's a really good idea, right? In fact, Jefferson alluded to it. I mentioned this. He wanted legislation passed that would make it impossible to execute certain types of process against the sitting executive, right? I think that's a, that's a good compromise. Um, but this entire business of while he's in office having this daily drum roll, uh, I think, I think it, it doesn't lead anywhere positive. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, does your analysis on this or your opinion change if it's directly maybe like an investigation of the president, like wanting to indict the president himself, or like the investigations into his close colleagues, like Stone, if they wanted to look into his crimes, whatever's happening there? Um, like, does your opinion change on the power to subpoena or maybe like does that change? Would it be a subpoena against Stone or the president? Well, so if the subpoena is directed to the president himself, I, I, I have an objection. If, if they're subpoenaing the president's subordinates or his cabinet, I don't care, right? Um, even the vice president, I think, is in a different spot. I don't think he's, I mean, we, we had an impeachment, I'm sorry, we had an indictment of a vice president, Spear Agnew, back in the 70s. And OLC said, yeah, the vice president can, can be impeached, I'm sorry, can be indicted, but not the president. So I think just the president's a unique person. He has certain powers no one else has, and he has certain immunities no one else has. I mean, I, I, we can talk about self-pardons maybe. I think that's actually a fun question, but if the president can pardon defense and can direct the executive branch, I think it stands to reason that the far lesser thing of not indicting him and not subpoenaing him falls into it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, in the back. So I understand that the, um, since the Ken Starr investigation with President Clinton, the rules have changed, so the Robert, Robert Mueller um, investigation was playing by a different set of rules. Yeah. 
do you think that it was a misstep by the Clinton administration and his counsel to agree to um, the subpoena of his blood in the uh, matter of um, um, the, I think that there was some investigation into his statement about not having any relation to the, um, anyone besides Jones. I think it was, I'm not sure if that was a civil. Did Clinton give a blood sample? He, I, 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 I that's this, that's new to me. That's news. Well, I. <laughs> uh, did they ever match the DNA to Clinton? I believe they did. Adam, I've, I've managed to forget. I I, I, I black out. <laughs> well, let me let me give this much. Right, I, this much I know. At the end of the Clinton administration, the independent counsel, who at that time was a guy named Robert Ray, who I'm co-counsel with in another case, did subpoena Trump. Um, <laughs> subpoena oh, comes out naturally. Did subpoena Clinton. Clinton voluntarily agreed to provide what they wanted. So they never actually had to litigate the subpoena issue. So I don't know if there was ever a subpoena that was actually litigated against the president. So, you, so it was, like it, Jefferson it, it, might, it might have been some sort of conciliation, if anything. Okay. Yeah. Is it really voluntary? Are you complying with the subpoena voluntary actors because you didn't litigate the subpoena? Yes. As a matter of precedent, yes. And, and, and let me make it a little more fine. The voluntary meeting might not be everything the special counsel wanted, right? Maybe you give like 80% of what he wanted and call it a deal. And that's sort of what Jefferson did. And that, that, that just might be the answer. Yeah. So you started the story with Jefferson. And I think the situation there makes a little bit more sense because it's a new republic. Um, there's a lot of tensions between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Um, they're trying to figure out a lot of these legal questions mm -hmm. and exactly how our government functions. Uh, so there I understand it. And I just wonder, is there any conclusion to be drawn from the fact that we've seen nothing for almost 200 plus years with the exception of maybe LinkedIn and Price cases, um, which you have very good comma book is, yes. um, you know, it, that doesn't bode well. Uh, the fact that maybe the only other flashpoint we've seen something like this was just before the Civil War, um, and so I just wonder: is there a conclusion to be drawn from the fact that we're seeing this now? Uh, you know, I'm not trying to call it the Doomsday Scenario or anything. But, well, uh, I, I think that this is right. So. Never. Right, so the notion, so, so, so the, the Jefferson thing came up in the unique, in the unique context where the former vice president wanted to subpoena the president for a document. That usually doesn't happen. Uh, there have been efforts where presidents have voluntarily testified in criminal trials. Jerry Ford did it. Um, I think Madison voluntarily gave some testimony from the White House. Uh, I think Bill Clinton did a video deposition for another case. So, but my, these things are happening voluntarily, right? It's conciliation, it's not by court order. Um, generally, people have an incentive to comply with prosecutors, but I'll put Ken Starr and Mueller in the same trap. Look, Bill Clinton was a smart lawyer and he perjured himself, right? Bill Clinton was a smart lawyer, slick willy, right? And, and, and Brett Kavanaugh and Ken Starr tripped him up and he perjured himself. Donald Trump would have perjured himself in about five seconds. <laughs> Within his first sentence, right, he would have perjured himself. I, I think it's a fair, I, I, you know, that's not, that's, I don't mean that as an a intindment, no pun intended, as a criticism of the president, when you have smart lawyers asking questions, and you have imprecise memories, you're gonna indict yourself. So I think there are very good reasons why the president, to the extent he can use this immunity, would, would try to use it. Most people can't. Look at Michael Flynn, right? He, he lied and now he's going to jail. Adam? Okay, so I have two questions. First yeah. one, all these arguments that the president should be either immune from process or should have some sort of protection against process while he's in office, all hinges on, as you said, so much of it hinges on the idea of we can't have one branch sort of dictating the actions of another. Well, to with the minute, we have a pretty easy escape hatch, right? Because we can hand off the executive power from one person to another. The president can hand it off or he can have it, mm. you know, taken away from him. So doesn't the 25th Amendment itself defuse a lot of these arguments and really um, undermine some of the arguments from presidential necessity? That's my first question. Mm. Second question is, the Marshall Burr, but the Marshall Jefferson standoff benefited from both of the, the two statesmen sort of flinching, right? Mm. I mean, given all of your study of constitutional law and separation powers, if you had to pick which branch should flinch first, which one would you pick? Oh, the courts. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, let me, let's start with the second question. It's a good question. I mean, these were statesmen, right? Like, behind the scenes, they, they, they hate each other's guts, right? Marshall and Hamilton and, and Jefferson. I mean, these guys were just going at it, right? Burr got into a duel, right? But at least on the outside, they made government work, right? They actually were able to do this. We can talk about Marbury for hours, but 
after Marbury, things just kind of went on. They didn't have this sort of dramatic conflict. Um, but in this sort of conflict, right, where you have Aaron Burr, who was going to be acquitted. The charges were bogus, right? He was going to be acquitted. I think Jefferson, I'm sorry, Marshall flinching there was absolutely called for. Because Marshall's like, the guy's going to walk in. Why am I going to, why am I going to fight and look like a loser? Because Jefferson ignores me when I can just let this go and just acquit the guy by giving a narrow instruction. So I think the courts are likely to flinch first. Um, the 25th Amendment point, I didn't, I didn't consider that. Because as my understanding, not from Twitter law, but from actual law, right? If the president has some sort of incapacity, he can step down temporarily and then reclaim it. But there's like a procedure for which he reclaims it. I remember a W stepped down when he had a surgery, and Dick Cheney was our president for like an hour or something. Remember that back in 2004 or so? I hold that one too. Oh boy, yeah, that could have been a biggie. And even even look when President Reagan was um, was shot. Not too far from here. Uh, we had President Bush for, for, for some, some, some period of time. And, and then there's a huge, what was that? Hague. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, President Haig, funny. So I think injecting the 25th Amendment creates a lot more chaos because there's always the conflict of can the president reclaim it? How long is it going to last? Uh, can the cabinet have cabals and intrigues? Uh, to the extent that the courts are, are more willing to serve process because the 25th Amendment is a backstop, I think that injects an entire new constitutional crisis that I don't want nothing to do with. Yeah. One more, maybe this is for your next law school exam. Oh, God. But you have the idea the president could, maybe we could just defer indictments until after the president leaves office. Well, could a president, could a president indict him, since he runs the executive branch, could he just indict himself and sign a plea agreement and then he have no liberty protections? Can the president indict himself and then sign a plea agreement. And then he's protected from double jeopardy. <laughs> uh, well, maybe the states can go after him, but yeah. I, I, I mean, I didn't talk about self-pardons. I mentioned it briefly, but I think that's a, look, so, I, so okay, the, the, the Constitution says the president can give a pardon for federal offenses, right? Generally, I'm a property professor also, the idea of giving a pardon requires two people, the grantor and the grantee, right? It's a strange thing to give yourself a pardon. So I think structurally and textually, the president can't do it. But if he did it, is a court going to now say, nope, this pardon's not valid, go indict him? Or if he handed off to the vice president under the 25th Amendment. That's the other one, yeah. He, pardon, yeah. he steps he aside. Back. Yeah, I'm back fresh and new, right? <laughs> Vote to Pence 2024, right? Uh, something like that. I, I, yeah, I, I, again, once you start getting to the 25th Amendment, you're in trouble, which is why I think the court should flinch. And be very hesitant to issue these sorts of subpoenas in judicial process. I, I mean, if you read the Nixon decision, it seems broad, but it's not. It's actually fairly narrow. And had Mueller gone after him, I would have had this article ready to roll, but I don't think he would have had the authority to do it. I will say, we've talked almost exclusively about the Burr case, and, and Professor Black's paper focuses on both. Um, we couldn't possibly do justice to both in an hour, so if you're interested in these issues, um, the paper is available on our website, but I'm sure this will be published somewhere soon. Eventually, yeah. Um, I got t so. I got, I'm actually doing a little bit more research. Um, I'm going, uh, I have an intern going, to the uh, Library of Congress to, oh, actually he goes here. Alex, what's his face? Uh, Alex, he, he's, he's interning at Cato this, this semester. What? Yeah, yeah, what's his last name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very, very helpful. I can't ever pronounce his last name. And he's actually going to the Library of Congress to look at the papers of how the draft opinions in Nixon developed. And my initial research is they originally put a little more emphasis on Burr, and then they sort of pulled it back. There's this one memo from Powell saying, uh, Burr doesn't stand for what you, say, what, what you think it says. It's a little bit more narrow. So I even want to show even on the Supreme Court, the justices are recognizing that this question is not settled by the Jefferson president. So I'm actually amplifying the paper. Well, if any of you would like to volunteer to be research assistant, hey, you. unpaid Otherwise, also. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking President Thank Martin. you so much. And uh, please help yourself to uh, uh, questions, questions, please. And so Thanks, on. Man. That's awesome. Thank you for coming. Thank you.